Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today to Advanced Power Solutions for Wearable Technology and Internet of Everything Sensors. I'm Steve Grady and I appreciate you spending some time with us today. I know you're busy. We've packed a lot into this session, so let's get started. This is the agenda for the webinar. First we're going to talk about wearable technology and Internet of Everything market dynamics. And then we're going to examine the wearable tech and Internet of Everything system components and the powering options. Then we're going to examine some techniques for harvesting ambient energy to recharge these devices. And we're going to look at the new technologies as well as the cost trade-offs for these advanced power solutions. I'm going to talk about some design tips and techniques for building ultra-low power systems with long battery life. And then we're going to look at some examples and do some teardowns of real-world energy harvesting powered wearable tech and IOE devices. Now there are some key trends driving innovation today. The first on the left you see is ultra low power. This is processors, microcontrollers, analog circuits, sensors, and wireless solutions. Now all of these new devices are becoming smart. They have sensors embedded in them and they're going to be deployed in billions of locations. The obvious way, of course, is to communicate using wireless, and we're finding that becoming the pervasive communications method. Everything is becoming very miniature and small, so we're finding things need to be integrated tightly together in tiny packages. And lastly, we hope that maybe we can use the ambient energy around these devices to power them, and throughout their life cycle, they need to be eco-friendly, especially at end-of-life at disposal. This is an interesting slide courtesy of Cisco. What it shows is the last 25 years of computing to where we are today. And of course in the 90s, we went to our device. We used our PCs, our computer terminals, and then our devices became mobile and the device came with us. And as we went throughout the early 2000s, we started to see smart things. And that really became the Internet of Things. Now this slide points to taking it one step farther, and this is where now intelligence is in the fabric of everything. In other words, intelligence and connectivity applies to people, process, data, and, and things. And so this is called the Internet of Everything. And what will happen is the capabilities, the sensors, will be embedded into the devices. You won't really know they're there. Might be your clothes, might be your washing machine, might be your car, might be your home might be your pets. But the point is they're all going to communicate together into a seamless environment. So as we look at the Internet of Everything, what's the scope and scale of the deployments? Well, if you ask HP or IBM or Cisco, they calculate that potentially could be billions upwards of a trillion devices. And it's such an important market that, for instance, Google just recently acquired Nest, which is a home thermostat company, for $3 billion. So obviously, there's great importance represented here as a business opportunity for all these, these companies. But the question, of course, is how are you going to power potentially billions of devices? And worse yet, if you are going to use primary batteries for a trillion devices, who's going to change one trillion batteries. So I think we're going to need to look at a different kind of powering technique versus just primary batteries. And that would be energy harvesting. This is the case where we can harvest energy from almost any environment. It might be light, might be vibration or motion, could be flow, could be from pressure, magnetic fields, RF, etc. Every industry segment will benefit by using energy harvesting powered devices because there's ambient energy in almost every situation. But you're going to need an energy harvesting transducer to convert the energy from these different modalities to electricity to run the system. You're probably going to have to store the energy in the system for the times that the energy harvesting transducer isn't available. And you're going to need high cycle life because you want this device to last the life of the product. So an ideal solution is a very cost-efficient, energy-efficient system that can be continuously cycled for the life of the product. 
This slide shows the power spectrum we'll be talking about in today's session. It ranges from nanowatts up through microwatts into the milliwatt range. Out in the, in the higher wattage range, that's more mobile communications, m to m networking, larger devices, and that won't be the scope of today's talk. We're going to focus in on solutions that provide microwatt, milliwatt types of powering for IOE and wearables. This is a diagram of an energy harvesting powered sensor. And you can see we have the power section below and then the microcontroller sensor and radio section above. We're going to spend most of our time today taking a look at the, the power section here. But you can see we're going to deploy some sort of energy harvesting transducer. We're going to convert that energy in a very high efficiency manner. Most of these systems are going to have an energy storage element in it for when the energy harvesting transducer is not available. That power then is going to be presented to the microcontroller sensor and radio complex. There's an important thing here to the right. You see the communications and control path. If your system is going to be energy aware, you need to be able to measure the input energy, understand the energy stored in the system, so the system always knows exactly what its energy status is. This way it can modify its behavior to optimize its performance. Say for instance the room's gone dark on a solar cell, it's operating off a battery. If the device knows that, it may change the timing between its output pulses, reporting say temperature, humidity, pressure, whatever the modality is, and then when the lights come back on, it can then reduce that, that time again and go back to uh, faster reporting times. So being energy aware is very important. Before we get too deep into the details of designing energy harvesting powered solutions, I want to introduce you to a couple of key concepts here. If you look at the chart on the left, you'll see the blue line represents the average standby or sleep power of the system. You absolutely want to minimize this as much as possible as the system spends most of its time in this mode. The yellow waveform represents the wireless transmission pulses that use a great deal of energy in terms of pulse current but happen infrequently in time. Again what you'd want to look at here is to reduce the amount of power per pulse and also space out the time between the pulses as much as you can in order to minimize the overall system power. So this is a rather busy chart, but it represents the various kinds of energy harvesting transducers we can use to power our system. We can harvest energy from light. We can harvest it from vibration or motion. We can harvest thermal gradients using thermoelectric generators, or maybe do something around RF or inductive harvesting. You can see here in the table, each of them have their own challenges. In some cases, they may be a DC voltage, in other cases an AC voltage. One of the key things to notice under typical impedance is with solar cells, they are a variable impedance type of device. However, the other ones are constant impedance, and we'll look at the power curves of each of these that are driven by the differences in impedance. But your Conversion circuits are going to need to take this into account, and we'll see that in a minute. Along with, you can see in the typical output power, we can range from just a microwatt up through you know, many, many milliwatts. So you have to account for that wide range as you're doing your circuit design as well. Let's look now at how to deal with these and design circuits for each of them. Here we introduce the concept of maximum peak power tracking, or MPPT. You see in the very simple circuit on the left-hand side there, what we're looking to do is match the impedance of the energy harvesting transducer source to the impedance of the load. You see in the simple graph on the right, we're looking at the ratio of the power of the load over power max of 1 and the resistance to the load divided by the resistance to the source at 1, and you can see the maximum peak power point there at the top of the curve. Let's look at some circuits as to how to do this. There are several kinds of power conversion techniques and MPPT algorithms. One are hill climbing algorithms, and we'll see those in just a second. Or you can also just do fractional OCV, or open circuit voltage, where you have a fixed ratio. 
Now these aren't as robust, but they can be simple to implement. And then it's a generic algorithm, perturb and observe, where you take samples and you basically move around and hone in on the maximum peak power point. Here we see a graph of a very impedance transducer, and the best example of that is solar. So you can see here the curve in red is volts, and the curve in blue is the power. And you'll notice that the peak power point is actually out at about 80% of the short circuit current. And you'll need to be able to track this as conditions change, whether the solar conditions change or potentially temperature can alter the transducer characteristics. You'll need to continually hone in on this maximum peak power point. And this is what the curve looks like for a constant impedance transducer. Not surprisingly, it's centered in over the midline of, of the volts. But again, these curves can move with changing conditions, especially temperature as well. So most of these energy conversion algorithms are active, and you'll need to invoke them from time to time to make sure that you're at the maximum peak power point. So here's another example of solar power. You can see that curve that we saw a minute ago on the left. Now, for these micro energy harvesting systems, you may do different combinations of either the solar cells in series or parallel to get from maybe a volt to four volts, depending on what you want your input range to be. And we're going to find that maximum peak power point and track it to optimize energy transfer. Now, a good example of a device that would do this is the Simbit CBC915 energy processor chip that has algorithms embedded in it to always find the maximum peak power point for either variable impedance transducers, such as solar, or the constant impedance, such as thermoelectric generators, vibrational harvesters, etc. This is an example of thermoelectric generator, and you can see on the left the family of curves differ by the temperature gradient. You can see down there uh, at the very bottom, the blue line is only 6.7 degrees Kelvin temperature differential, and way up on top is 32 degrees Kelvin. And you can see where the maximum peak power point moves around. So you can imagine now that you do have to track it as the temperature gradient changes on the on the source that you're extracting energy from, you will have to move your maximum peak power point. And you can see in the curve on the right, there's an example of that hill climbing algorithm we talked about a few slides ago, where I'm moving from A to B, I move over to C, I find I've gone too far, and I home back on, on the maximum peak power point. So again, this is an active algorithm. When we sit down with our customers and talk about energy harvesting, we're often asked about the the costs of an energy harvester versus primary batteries. And of course, usually the first cost of a primary battery is quite a bit lower than the cost of an energy harvesting system. However, the next few slides, I want you to consider the lifetime cost, and we'll find that energy harvesters can be very cost effective. So obviously, designs that do not have a, a charging source are going to use either a primary battery or some sort of energy harvester. So let's go ahead and now and model the energy harvester as a variable capacity battery and understand what that costs versus the cost of a primary battery. So first we'll calculate the dollars per milliamp hour for a primary battery. This is a good metric using the cost per capacity to measure the cost effectiveness of a device. And you can see various kinds of batteries listed here under the first bullet. You can see, uh, and again, we're using 1,000 piece quantities from distributors such as DigiKey, Mauser, others. You can use a CR2032 coin cell and a holder. And at 225 milliamp hours divided in its cost, you get about 0 0.0016 cents per milliamp hour. Now, a Tataran coin cell is more robust. You can also see that it's an amp hour for, for that device. And you can see the cost there is 0 0.0048 cents per milliamp hour. AAA alkaline batteries, two of them to uh, create a three volt system at a milliamp hour, runs about 0 0.0017 
cents per milliamp hour. And something like a Simbit Enerchip, very unique solid state battery, runs about 0 0.0054 per milliamp hour, somewhat similar to the Tataran batteries as they're both specialty batteries. So let's calculate now the cost of an energy harvester. And here we're going to model it as a variable capacity battery. Now, the output energy of a harvester, of course, depends on the ambient energy conditions. And there will be a min-max energy output range, depending on, on the conditions that the harvester is exposed to. What we're going to do now is take the cost of the transducer and the interface components, the storage components, and the conversion electronics together. And you can see there the costs for, for instance, a Sanyo solar cell, some conversion electronics, energy batteries, you take the power input of that kind of device under 400 lux, and here we're assuming that the light's on all the time, and you can play around with a mix of light on, light off. But here you can see that the capacity over a 10-year lifespan is 7,700 milliamp hours, almost 8 amp hours. Now, if you take the cost of all those components and divide it by the milliamp hours, you can see here that you get 0.00. .00 one three cents per milliamp hour, which is essentially lower than the cost of the AAA or coin cells. So the key takeaway here is that you can design energy harvesters as cost effectively as primary batteries over the life of the product. Of course, you can consider here that I'm getting potentially eight amp hours out of this system. I'd have to change my AAA batteries eight times over the life of the product to have the equivalent energy stored as the harvester is giving me. So you can see it's very effective. Now you also need to assign value to energy harvesting power solution over batteries, especially number one is the battery change out cost. If that's an issue in the system and someone's going to pay to have to maybe go up in a very difficult location and change out a battery, that can have a very high value and make energy harvesting systems very cost effective. But you also have to take a look at the laundry list here. I'm not going to read it all. Uh, you can kind of scan through it. But what are the overall power requirements? How long does the device have to last? The, the footprint of the device. Do you want to seal the device? Are there aging characteristics? Are there high temp characteristics? Does the device have to be transported? Are there going to be transportation restrictions? You need to take all these things into account. So to sum up the discussion we just had over the last few slides on energy harvesting and looking at this part of a wearable tech or Internet of Everything sensor is what are the costs of the energy harvester, what are the benefits of the energy harvester, you're able to assign value to those, and the requirements of the device as it pertains to the performance and the design are all important things to take into consideration. Now, one of the key statistics, this is an interesting slide, if we had 50 billion wireless devices and you could power them with just a single coin cell, laid end to end, they'd circle the earth four times. And it really is a waste question. Of course, the thing to take into consideration is how many times maybe do you have to change a coin cell in a device over its life? So this is a, a key issue, and we need to look to maybe some new technology solutions to replace these kinds of, of wasteful batteries. So if we're going to look at a new battery that can address the requirements that we opened the session with, we need to look to something different than coin cells and super caps because they are larger and have a bulky size. You really can't integrate them into to small packages. They do wear out and in some cases die. And there's toxic chemicals in these batteries and super caps. So a better solution. This is an example of a rechargeable battery from Simbit. This is the inner chips. We actually build them on silicon wafers using semiconductor techniques. Some of our customers use the bare dye directly in their product, or we also package them in plastic parts. So they come on tape and reel, surface mount assembly, reflow solder. They're treated like every other chip on the board. They're meant to last the life of the product because they're rechargeable thousands of times and have some very unique characteristics that are quite favorable for these kind of devices. 
Ender chips are used in three main application areas. The first is power backup as a secondary power backup for the main power fails. We talked a little bit about our customers using bare die embedded directly in the product. You can see here on the left laid out side by side in a small device or potentially even stacked in a wedding cake. Ender chips can also be bumped and you can use them in a flip chip configuration. But here we're talking about using them as the rechargeable primary energy source in these energy harvesting style devices. Now solid state batteries are kind of the best of both worlds. Super caps, of course, have high power density and batteries have high energy density. What you kind of want to have is a device that suits in the middle and solid state batteries do that. High cycle life, but also very good energy density. And as you're looking at energy storage devices for these kinds of wearable tech or IOE sensors, you're going to want to look for these kind of characteristics. High cycle life on the device, a flat output voltage which simplifies the electronics, a very fast and simple charge mechanism, and very low self-discharge. And in all cases, solid state batteries are an ideal choice. Solid state batteries, since they're ultra thin, also can assist in shrinking the devices. And in this example, we looked at some Internet of Things type of sensors. In the upper left hand corner, that's a energy harvesting powered system for the food industry that does temperature and humidity sensing. Here, they actually took AAA batteries out of the system, used a solar cell and solid state batteries instead. The next item down is actually an inner node. Here we've taken smaller solar cells and you can see in the red board just to the right of the device four solid state batteries with an energy processor to do the maximum peak power energy conversion. We can continue to get smaller. The next device down uses chip stacked die and you can see where the arrow is pointing there there's a four stack of inner chip solid state battery bare die in that system we take it even a step farther down on the bottom that's a one millimeter cubed device it's an interocular pressure sensor used in the eye and we'll explain that in a minute so see what we've done here by using ultra thin rechargeable energy storage we've reduced in an Internet of Everything sensor 144,000 times. So if you're thinking about how to successfully design an energy harvesting system, here's four key things to consider. The first is you have to determine the energy available from your environment. What's the type of energy available, the amount of energy, and, and the duty cycle of that energy. Then you're going to want to harvest it as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. And we talked about using maximum peak power tracking algorithms and optimized circuits. This is a key when we work with our customers to calculate the application power requirement in all operational modes. So what you need to understand is what's your sleep currents, what's your sensing currents, what's it take to run the radios, all the different modes the device can be in initialization and startup is a key, especially around wireless protocols. We found that many of them aren't optimized for energy harvesting and, and kind of thrash to bring the system up and it drains the system, never really gets initialized properly. So number three is an important one. And the last one is to size your energy storage for when the ambient energy isn't available. So you're always able to carry your device through if the energy harvesting transducer is not active. Now the industry is providing ultra low power solutions in all areas. We're seeing great breakthroughs in ultra low power microcontrollers, even with nano app sleep currents now. A lot of energy is being spent on developing low power radio transceivers and energy efficient protocols. Obviously all the 802.15.4 variants, seeing six low pan, which provides IP type of services here. Bluetooth smart is ramping very quickly. And things like the Ant Plus protocol or an Ocean protocols are also used. So also micropower sensors, we're seeing a lot of attention paid. For instance, Sensoron has some very nice devices. NXP has introduced some CMOS sensors 
Uh, TI has some very low power Hall effect sensors. So again, to lower the power budget, new sensors are coming to market. And also really looking at lowering the quest and current on the power management ICs, timers, A to Ds, et cetera. All the things in the products are becoming ultra low power. Here are some techniques for running Internet of Things, Internet of Everything sensors on a micro watt of average power. First, there are MCUs off the shelf today capable of running micro watt computing. First, you're going to run the MCU quite a bit slower. In some cases, you're going to run thousands of instructions per second, not millions of instructions per second. But most of these sensors are doing very little, and so it's a mode you can run in quite capably. You're going to want to sample your sensors maybe one to ten times a second. You're going to use an ultra low power standby clock. You're going to look for devices that have instant on and very accurate high speed clock once they're up and running. And all the I.O. interrupt capability and RAM is retained in these ultra low power modes. Now there's some traps you want to be careful of, especially when you're writing your firmware. No loops at all. You want to be completely interrupt driven. Be careful of temperature in your device. Environmentals can change the leakage significantly, so make sure you understand how your devices react over temp range. You don't want any floating inputs in your hardware design. You gotta make sure that you can live in a, a multiple voltage domain and satiate those requirements. Watch for undeterministic clocking. And also, if you can run around two volts in the system, again, of course, you'll save power in that mode as well. Now, there may be situations where you can't start a design completely from scratch using the low power components we talked about on the previous slide. So in this case, you can use a power switching technique called an interrupt. In this case, you actually turn the power on or off to the system. Now, an ideal device for this kind of implementation is the Simbit Enerchip RTC, either the 34803 or 34813. In the lowest power timer mode, the Enerchip RTC only uses 14 nanoamps of current. These simple schematics show how it would be implemented. In the first figure, we're actually switching the ground, or VSS. So there the ground is tied to the Enerchip directly. In the second case, you actually tie the interrupt up to a FET and control the main power rail, the VCC, turn the power on or off that way. There's pros and cons to either design, and you'll find that uh, Simbit has AppNote AN1059, which will describe this on Simbit.com. This table from that app note shows the example power savings using an interrupt circuit. You can see there's a number of variables here around the original sleep current and microamps, the active run times, the sleep periods, the number of instructions run every time it wakes up. But the key column is the one on the far right where the power savings ratio, when that is above one, you're extending battery life that number of times. So that table goes all the way up to an example where it shows you can extend the battery life 11 times using this technique. Now as we look at some of the Internet of Everything, one area to look at is uh, the end devices running Bluetooth Smart, Bluetooth 4.0. And one of the reasons is the interoperability is so simple. The devices all come up and register and find each other whether they're a registered situation or maybe, for instance, the new Bluetooth beaconing capabilities where it's a transmit only. Here's an example of that, courtesy of Dialog. Here they've built a small beacon using a solar cell. And you can see here it works in the dark for two to three hours in its current configuration. It runs 50 hours in standby mode. And it'll do three connections per second in relatively low office light. And we'll see the internal battery in this device is actually an inner chip, chip battery using the ultra low power Dialog Bluetooth smart chip. So here's a teardown of the beacon. You can see that on the left side there you've got the Bluetooth smart device. 
and a small inverted antenna. You've got your crystals. Here, the solar cell is on the bottom shown. It's tied into a Texas Instruments BQ25504 power management IC. And then the battery for the system is a Simbit Enerchip. And you can see here that this device is 25 millimeters on a side, or about an inch square. Now we're working with Dialog to actually shrink this down further and actually make it lower power. So you'll see a number of iterations here as this device becomes smaller and uses less power in future iterations. I promised earlier I'd talk about the interocular pressure sensor. This work was done at the University of Michigan. And you can see here, this is a four layer stack, all comprised in a one millimeter cubed package. The bottom layer is a MEMS pressure sensor. And this is used to measure the pressure in an eyeball for the glaucoma patients. And the intent of the device is to transmit this pressure value to a wand that's held up in front of the eye. On top of the pressure sensor is a Simbit Enerchip battery, and then an ultra low power microcontroller that has the A to D for the pressure sensor. On top of that is a small solar cell and a wireless transceiver. So you see all these elements combined are a great example of a tiny energy harvesting powered Internet of Everything device. Continuing on the ophthalmic track, we see here a concept of a smart contact lens. And as we go around the outside in a clockwise fashion, you can see there's a solar cell module, a biosensor, the ultra low power management IC with integrated ultra low power microcontroller, and then there's a wireless communication method. Now that coil around the outside of the contact lens could also potentially be used for a wireless charging mechanism. And then over on the left there is an Enerchip non-cytotoxic rechargeable solid state battery. It's ultra thin and you notice here that uh, Enerchips can actually be made in, in various shapes. So again here we have a fully self-contained energy harvesting powered device that certainly will see millions if not billions of this kind of device deployed in the future as well. So to sum up, there will be billions of smart devices deployed over the next 10 years and they need to be powered autonomously. We have to have a power source that lasts the life of the device. and Everything needs to be small, integrated and cost effective. And we've seen in this presentation today that you can build cost effective energy harvesting solutions that can power these products Success here is going to be based on converging the designs around high efficiency and cost effective energy harvesting transducers, using high efficiency power conversion, including maximum peak power tracking, life of product energy storage, using things such as the Simbit Enerchip solid state battery, using ultra low power microcontrollers, sensors, and radios, and optimizing the system architecture, hardware, and firmware. So we're going to take some uh, Q&A right now. Before we do that, though, and I'll leave this slide up, there's some excellent resources for you to pursue post this presentation. If you go to simbit.com, there's a free executive briefing on today's symposium. It gets into more detail. It's about 17 pages long, so it's a, it's a nice document to explain much of what we talked about today. You'll find that on our white paper page. You can register to win a free evaluation kit and also... All of our data sheets, application notes, case studies, and reference designs are available to you on the website as well. If you have any questions, you can email me directly, and there's my email address below. Thanks for spending time. I know it was a lengthy session, but I hope you got uh, some new ideas. You learned some things here. We'd love to follow up more with you, so feel free to contact us. And now we'll turn it over for some Q&A.